Hello and welcome to Afternoon Tea with Docs. I am Dr. Erica, a GP and lifestyle medicine physician from West Midlands, UK. If you're new to us, a very warm welcome to you. Um, and we are here um, every Sunday at 5 p.m. UK time to bring you um, world-renowned experts like our, our guest today, um, Professor Jason Carlowish, to bust misinformation and to provide you with uh, practical evidence-based lifestyle practices that you can implement right away to prevent, treat, uh, and uh, at times even reverse some of the lifestyle-related chronic illnesses in a supportive community setting. And if you've joined us on Zoom today, you'll have the opportunity after the interview to speak to us uh, and also where with our guest expert um, off camera um, to ask your burning questions um, and also to get to know the ATWD community. Um, do let us know where you have joined in from uh, and what's brought you here today. Um, and it's lovely to, to see um, some of our um, the familiar faces and names in in the um, in the audience. So um, today we'll be talking to Professor Carla Wish about um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And I wonder how many uh, or um, in the audience, if uh, you've got anyone, um, if you know people uh, living with um, or, or care for people um, with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. If you feel comfortable to let us know, please you know, say yes in the chat if you feel comfortable to do so. Um, Professor um, Carla Wish is a physician writer uh, and he researches and writes about issues at the intersections uh, of bioethics aging and the neurosciences. He is a professor of medicine, medical ethics, health policy and neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's also co-director of the Penn Memory Center where he cares for his patients. His incredible book, The Problem of Alzheimer's was released earlier this year and it's an elegantly written blend of history, science and philosophy. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here, Erica. So, Greetings from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's start with uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself. What's inspired you to, to become a doctor uh, and, uh, and also maybe your path to becoming a geriatrician and then a, an Alzheimer's disease specialist? Sure. Yeah. Again, greetings, everyone. Hi, I'm talking to you from my uh, home in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is a state on the East Coast of the United States. It's about a little bit afternoon here on a beautiful autumn day. Um, I'm in my hall on the third floor in my study. I'm in the room where I wrote the book, actually, and right over there is the desk I wrote it at. Um, uh, and I once once a week, I see patients at the Penn Memory Center for diagnosis and treatment, follow them up for care. Um, and the rest of the week, I work on my research and writing. Um, uh, and uh, uh, my research team, we call our lab the uh, P3MB, the Penn Program for Precision Medicine for the Brain. It focuses on um, uh, the biomarker transformation of uh, brain diseases, particularly Alzheimer's disease, with attention to the intersecting ethical policy and clinical issues. So we're very interested, for example, in how learning Alzheimer's biomarker results alters people's sense of, of, of self and, and uh, sense of the future, for example. We also have a project that's looking at communication between caregivers and persons with advanced dementia, people who have notable communications impairments, um, with a particular keen interest in um, episodes of paradoxical lucidity. And uh, I've gotten very interested through that work in um, theory of mind and extended mind. Um, uh, one of my colleagues in that is Andrew Peterson, who's a philosopher of mind at uh, a university here in the States. So that's sort of what I'm currently doing. On my writing table, uh, as we speak, is an essay about John Keats's Ode to a Nightingale, which I think is one of the finest pieces of medical humanities ever written. Um, and uh, I'm uh, working on that with great zeal. 200 years ago this year, uh, Keats died uh, in, in, uh, of tuberculosis at the young age of 23 or so in Rome. But uh, anyway, so that's, that's what my current writing is. I'm, but I'm a, I am a geriatrician. I trained in internal medicine. 
Um, and uh, then I did additional training in geriatric medicine. And right out of the gate after that training, I came to Penn as an instructor and I've been there ever since doing this work. Um, but a little bit of the background behind that, I, you know, I wanted to be a doctor since I was, I suppose, a child. I confess um, the sort of space set of, of sort of options for career were a bit determined by a family, um, but I didn't want to do what I think they wanted me to do, which was to go into business. Or, um, and I, I was sort of always interested in science, and so medicine seemed like a very smart thing to do. But I also was always a writer, actually, um, as a kid. Uh, I mean, a, a truly a little kid. Um, and I always, I actually dug up one of my notebooks. I have I've kept notebooks since I was, I don't know, 16. And in that first notebook, I was musing about just that, becoming a physician and writer when I got into med medical school around the age of 17. I think there was one, there's a couple of key moments in my career that occurred at key times in my life, um, which I look back on and see how life is such a set of almost coincidences. But I'll, I'll tell you what two of them are. Um, one was I got into a program at a university here in the States called Northwestern University uh, in Chicago, Illinois. And um, it admitted me to medical school right out of high school, although I did three years of college before that at Northwestern. So when I did college, I didn't have to do any of the usual pre-medical work, um, including the competition that you often go through to get into medical school in the United States. It's very competitive. And for me personally and characterologically, I think that was an enormous, I think that's why I'm here today because I, I didn't have to struggle with all the pre-med stuff. I just took the classes I wanted to take and much of the books I read and studied are on the shelf behind me even now. And I think kind of the why I am what I am now is in part because I had a really good college education that wasn't burdened with the pre-med grind as they call it. Anyway, um, another key event in my life was I was gonna be a critical care doctor. And I talk about this in the book. I was going to pursue care in uh, intensive care medicine. Um, I was pretty good at it. Um, I liked the physiology and I liked taking care of sick people. I, I confess as a physician, I, I got a, there's this charge, a high energy kind of ethical frisson of taking care of ill people. And by the time I'd finished my residency though, before I started the fellowship, I was very interested in aging. I was very interested in what's the difference between aging and disease and how do we draw those distinctions. And I cared for a lot of elder adults. So I went off to University of Chicago. I did an ethics fellowship there. They have a program in medical ethics. And then I was going to stay and do critical care. And I worked in a chronic vent unit to make some money on the side. And anyway, I was seeing I'm more interested in aging, I think, but whatever. And then um, we kind of knew my grandfather wasn't doing well. He was diagnosed with dementia. We sort of tried to figure things out. Anyway, I talk about this in the book. He falls, he breaks his hip, he goes to the best academic medical center in the region, and within six months, he's dead. <laughs> yeah. And I kind of realized, you know, we don't need more critical care doctors. You know, we need more geriatricians, and that's really what you want to do. So I quit. I switched to geriatric medicine, which was like the shocker of shockers. I talk about in the book how um, people were like, did you do something wrong? <laughs> yeah. Where you're like, fired or something and this was you know like and like no no I, 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 this is this was intentional and um, and I've never looked back since uh, on that uh, decision never regretted it absolutely no criticism of critical care I mean the last several months of uh, years have shown us the intense need for intensivists but the last several months have also showed us intense need for people like me um, when we saw how people who uh, with particularly vulnerable adults with cognitive impairment became when the system completely vanished for their care. Um, and, and so, you know, my focus is older adults uh, with cognitive impairment um, as a clinician. And uh, I, I greatly enjoy the work. And um, uh, 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 I, I um, uh, also enjoy the blending of my work as a physician and a writer. I find that extremely fulfilling. In the book, when you, when you talked about um, your grandfather's experience with uh, dementia, um, and it just it resonated with me because I I often think that um, the the stories you told around it, um, I often think that as as doctors we are really trained to see people as body parts um, uh, and. Uh, and specialties don't talk to specialties. And now we don't have 
we don't just have specialties, we have subspecialties. Um, and it feels like medical care has been very much fragmented. And we kind of have stopped seeing uh, people as a whole and just, you know, as I said, seeing people as body parts. Yeah. That, is that something that you, you have also experienced in your, in your years of practice? Oh, yeah, I was not just experienced on the patient side mm -hmm. with my grandfather, but certainly been per a perpetrator of it uh, when I trained and when I was a physician, um, sometimes witting, probably so, so oftentimes unwitting. I have no problem with specialization. I mean, if you think about us as humans, we're quite specialized, you know, eyes, ears, dexterous <laughs> hands, but we are coordinated. <laughs> yes. We put it all together. And I, so I have no objection to specialization. What I object to, and I think we ought to object to, is the lack of what you said that I think is the key thing there is coordination and communication. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, you know, um, there's, there's many routes to that. Some of it is by our own intention. Some of it's by um, the system. I mean, uh, up until recently, you know, the paper chart, especially in the States, was a mess. You know, everyone had their own private charts and they didn't really put anything in them anyway. And, well, you know, electronic medical record has, when used rightly, really brought down all those barriers of communication. When used rightly, I mean, unfortunately, because it became people discovered how you could pack a note with a lot of nonsense to get a, a gin up a billing code, although that's been changing now. Um, but you're right, the experience with my grandfather was the best of care and the worst of care, to paraphrase yeah. Dickens. Namely, you know, he had a great titanium hip implant and, you know, whatever else. Um, but, you know, uh, I mean, they, they they made no effort to find out about his cognitive problems. They, it just, it, it, it was, I mean, they came in, a, a geriatric researcher came in to study what it would be like for him at home. But meanwhile, no one was paying attention to his needs in the hospital. And I'm not whining, like, I'm just, it just was such basic stuff. And I think one of the points I make in the book is there are here and now things that we can do now to improve the care of persons with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, who have dementia or other causes of dementia, whether that's Alzheimer's, Lewy body disease, et cetera. And one of them is coordinated care, you know. Um, and I, I, I actually, you know, went and found uh, these two physicians at this out of the way hospital in New York State um, who put together this hip fracture care program. And it's a great story because they were at this hospital, it was kind of ready to go bankrupt. Um, and they, they could do whatever they wanted because no one really cared anymore. <laughs> and, um, and so they're like, they were seeing how these older adults would come into the ER with a hip fracture and like the cardiologist, uh, the, the, the anesthesiologist wouldn't touch them until the cardiologist saw them. The cardiologist saw them, uh, and thought that they couldn't go to surgery until they, and no one would take care of the patient. Um, and they would just sit in the ER on the wards until finally they said, all right, you know, get them into the OR. And by then they were dehydrated, already delirious and the rest is history. And it's kind of my grandfather's story. And, um, and they said there has to be a better way. And they knew the better way was not we have to discover the secret sauce of some technology, not to criticize technology, but we just have to figure out how to work together. And that's the story I tell of these two physicians who just figured out how to work together and create this hip fracture program. And the proof is in the pudding. Well, I'm not sure if the pudding is the right word, but you know, after several years, their outcomes were spectacular. Um, rates of delirium, death, uh, time to discharge, not coming back to hospital, all improved. And meanwhile, the academic mecca that owned them, which was University of Rochester, quite frankly, they still had the same rates of delirium, et cetera, because they weren't, they were just, they weren't coordinating their care. Mm. Um, so yeah, there are very can-do things we can do right now to treat the person as a person. And in the case of persons with dementia, I think this is another key point I make in the book. You have got to see them as a as a mind dyad with a, at least one other person, and that's the person we call their caregiver. Yeah, and I, and, and 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 that that dyad is so important. And uh, we've mentioned quite a few terms here, uh, and I think this would be a great time to actually clarify what what can be very confusing for a lot of people is the definitions. Yeah, of yeah, what, language what is, in this field is a mess. Yeah. What is dementia? What is yeah. Alzheimer's disease? What is cognitive impairment? What is the difference between them? Yeah, great questions. And nomenclature, or that is to say the lack of a coherent nomenclature haunts this field. It really does. It's the cause of substantial confusions clinically, but also at a policymaking level when you try to get, frankly, the politicians to pay attention and do things. It's absolutely spectacular, the dissonance of language. Um, 
so, you know, what's dementia? Dementia describes uh, disabling cognitive impairments, meaning an individual prior had cognition that allowed him, her to function in the world, but now has developed progressive disabling cognitive impairments. And the key word there is disabling, namely, they're not just cognitive problems, but they're translating into troubles doing life's everyday activities. And so, um, and I like to think of it that way because I think it upends the sort of idea um, of uh, uh, disability as a physical thing, right? The, oh, disability, you can't walk, can't move about. No, disability can also be caused by cognitive problems. And so the classic early story of someone with dementia is not troubles bathing, dressing, grooming, and feeding. Those happen much later. The troubles usually are around decision making. In other words, the example I have to give is in the evening saying, what do I want for dinner? Going out and buying the food, paying for it, cooking it, cleaning it up. Someone with dementia will have some troubles in some of aspects of those things. They might be able to do some of it, but not as well as they used to. So someone else has to step in and their wheelchair, if you will, and I know it's a brutal metaphor, but their wheelchair is their caregiver. The caregiver is the one that says, I'll go get the food or I'll cook it, but you clean, et cetera. So that's dementia, disabling cognitive impairments, progressive occurring in someone who was previously cognitively unimpaired and functional, dementia. Many different diseases cause dementia. And your and the sine qua na, the, the marquee disease, of course, is Alzheimer's, but it is not the only cause of dementia. In fact, the more we study Alzheimer's, the more we see that people we thought had just Alzheimer's actually have a variety of other pathologies. But Alzheimer's is one of the main causes. It's a disease described by two different misfolded proteins in the brain. And we'll talk about them in a minute. But there are other diseases that clearly cause dementia. One of your chat room people I just saw pop up described one of the other causes of dementia, which is the disease called front, frontal temporal lobar degeneration, or FTLD. Very different set of pathology. When you slice the brain up and look under the microscope, very different clinical history in terms of the story the patient and the family will tell. Lewy body disease is a different disease that causes dementia. And in the United States, the, there's a famous comic actor named Robin Williams, and he had that disease um, and, and, and uh, died of it, actually died of it by suicide. Um, so vascular disease can cause dementia. But the concluding point I'll leave is these diseases oftentimes co-mingle and coexist in the brain of someone. Um, and indeed, we're discovering new diseases that cause dementia. Um, in older adults, a protein called TDP43, which leads to DNA methylation or something like that, uh, misfolds and can cause a, a later life dementia as well. So that's the distinctions between Alzheimer's and dementia. And cognitive impairment is just kind of a clunky way to simply say uh, that the, the behaviors of the brain, memory, language, spatial function, planning, attention, that some of those one or more are impaired. They're not as good functioning as the, they used to be for that person. So those are those distinctions uh, so, between those terms. So dementia can have many causes right. um, and you can have Alzheimer's disease without having dementia. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. Sure. Yeah, because if you think about it, just, you know, walk back. The, these diseases are slow and insidious and there's no question that the pathologies start before someone's symptomatic. This is not like COVID where you're good in the morning until late afternoon, you feel a bit of a cough and fever and, you know, the infection occurred in between. Mm. Um, this is more like, say, a colonic cancer where a polyp develops and over years grows and grows until it, the, it spreads through the basement membranes, metastasis, that's cancer. That's the way Alzheimer's works. It works. It's not, <laughs> that's, that's the same story. And you're absolutely right. Years before dementia, the pathology can be there. And in between, there's this period called mild cognitive impairment, an extremely clunky, awkward term described uh, by researchers at Rochester, Minnesota in the late 90s that, uh, in America that um, describes the sort of earliest clinical symptoms of the disease. Uh, and you just mentioned COVID there. Um, and Actually, the pandemic um, impact on people living with dementia, um, it's especially uh, apparent in places like care homes and nursing homes. Right. Um, and you said earlier that um, just as physical you know, disabilities, they, they have devices like a, a wheelchair 
or a scooter. Um, a person with dementia's device is their caregiver. So their wheelchair equivalent is their caregiver. Uh, and in, in some instances in nursing homes and, and residential homes, because of you know, social distancing uh, and safety in it, during the pandemic, we've kind of taken that metaphoric um, wheelchair away from yep. people with dementia, haven't we? Have you, yeah. have you seen some, um, in terms of clinical practice, have you seen the effects of that on your patients? Tragically, sadly, yes. So what happened with the pandemic? And, you know, it's, it's easy, easy. It's for reasons, I think, to survive now, right now, we, I don't want to say we've forgotten, but we've put aside those early months in 2020, March of 2020 in the States here, when we didn't know what was going to happen. And I mean, it was scary. And in those early months, in those early weeks, you know, I understand the lock down the care homes. Only the staff comes in because we don't know how infectious this is. And, you know, I get it. That was the acute stage of the pandemic. Um, now, as we've learned more, and especially that we have vaccines, things have changed. But what we learned in the pandemic was if you reduce um, and otherwise distance the ability of people to care for people who have disabling cognitive impairments, they will suffer. Not a surprise, but there was an interesting insight. The staffs in many facilities um, were thinned as well because of illness. They either quit or in some cases sadly died. But even in places where the staff was still able to come in and do what they needed to do, what you saw was patients still getting ill, meaning getting losing weight, getting agitated, falling. Um, and, and the reason is because the families were left out, other caregivers were left out. And what you suddenly began to realize was these visitors to the nursing home, many of them, some of them are just visitors. They're like, I'm just here to see, I haven't seen my grandmother in eight months, you know, I'm not trying to dismiss that visit but it's a visit, but some of them were caregivers. And in fact, there is data that individuals who have zero visitors in a nursing home do worse than individuals who have one visitor at least coming in. And if you think about it, what's going on, and the family members told us this, you know, they would say, I can't get in to see my wife, my husband, my mother, and you know, I'm the one that motivates her to eat. I'm the one that convinces the staff, no, no, get her up when she complains, that's just mom, get her out, get her in the wheelchair, et cetera. Um, and and that, was, that was taken away. And, and what we saw, the consequence was in long-term care facilities in the United States, I know that data, you saw more deaths, no surprise, COVID was there. But they weren't all COVID cases. We saw what were called excess deaths. In other words, over and above what we were expecting, some from COVID and some from their diseases got worse. And that was because we took away care. And we saw that in the community as well. I can't have the person come over who is there four hours a day. So I'm taking care of this person all the time, et cetera. And people did worse and caregivers did worse. So the, the pandemic was a vicious, awful, natural experiment in what if you take away care? And what we saw was just that. And my only hope, not only, I'll strike that, but one of my hopes out of this pandemic is that we've become woke to caregiving. In my country, for example, that we recognize that these individuals who give what's called unskilled care, whatever that means, that it's actually highly skilled care and should be valued and paid appropriately um, because it, it's what keeps a mind alive. And well, we'll go into caregiving in, the, in, the, in a little bit, um, but you just mentioned about, you know, de excess deaths and actually, uh, in, in England, um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease is the number one cause of death in England, which surprises a lot of people. And I wondered if, if you could maybe elaborate on the mechanism of this. Does it cause death directly or, yeah. or indirectly through um, other things such as falling over uh, or infections? Or, or a oh. bit of both. And I think the answer is a bit of both. Um, you know, uh, uh, I just had a patient die last week um, and 
she is an example of uh, all disease is awful. If, dis if disease wasn't bad, it shouldn't be a disease, by the way. But this disease is uniquely bad, and it is uniquely distinctly bad in individuals who don't have any other illnesses, who are not old <laughs> by the definition of just being over 70, 75. Because these folks with the early onset disease, she had her onset, I think, late 50s, even at, uh, that, at, that young, they will live far into the disease. And that's what happened to, to this patient who died at home in the care of her family in hospice. And essentially, um, she did what I, I see patients do uh, in the advanced stages of the disease. They eat less and less, takes them longer to eat, um, less and less. And interestingly, and I don't think we quite understand this, the metabolism of what they eat clearly isn't as efficient. They lose weight despite eating. Mm. Um, and uh, anyway, um, she essentially stopped eating. Um, she essentially just ate less and less, took in less and less, and um, and then and died. Um, and so the the sort of if you had to pick the sort of most sort of Alzheimer's tip, typical way of dying or dementia typical way, it is this sort of progressive decline in eating, taking in food, metabolizing it, as well as mobility, et cetera. But you're right. The other point you made was there are these other things that occur. Um, such as a fall, hip fracture, and the attendant consequence of that, that was the case of my grandfather, or infection, et cetera, um, and just also take the person's, uh, reduce their physiologic reserve down even more. Um, but yes, I mean, the disease should rightly be viewed, as, these diseases should be viewed as terminal illnesses. They cause someone to die. It's interesting to dispute over that question, and, and you know, some people don't think they're terminal illnesses and shouldn't be put on the death certificate. Um, which makes, I think, which is wrong, but it's haunted the field, which is doctors wouldn't record Alzheimer's as a cause of death because they didn't think it, quote, caused death. And so there's a big move in the 80s and 90s into the early aughts to sort of increase the coding of Alzheimer's as a cause of death or contribution to death. And so you'd see these jumps in the, in the spikes and in, in, in the ranking, not because there are more people dying, but because there's better coding. Um, of Alzheimer's as a cause of death than there used to be. Uh, the first case I coded, I remember I was a fellow in the nursing home seeing patients, and I um, wrote Alzheimer's disease as the cause of death on the death certificate, and the nurse who was there next to me said, I didn't think Alzheimer's caused death. Um, and, you know, so I, I didn't challenge her, but I said, well, what do you think this person died of in the other room? I mean, you know, um, I'd be interested to see what she would have said. Mm. And going on to kind of the uh, identity and the humanity bit behind the, the condition, I think for many of us, we take our autonomy and identity for granted and don't really think much of it. Um, but for some people, they haven't always had the luxury of this, uh, even in recent years, and really have had to fight for it. Uh, and unfortunately, some still don't. Um, and as you said in, in the book, uh, dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease, they're diseases of our autonomy. Can yeah. you expand on that a bit? Yeah, the idea of Alzheimer's, and again, I'm using Alzheimer's as the sort of, you know, marquee disease, but we could have the same conversation about Lewy body disease or frontal temporal lobe our generation. But, you know, one of the key insights when I wrote the book um, you know, the subtitle is how science, culture, and politics turned a rare disease into a crisis. A longer subtitle would be how science and culture turned a rare disease into a common disease. And, and I had this sort of breakthrough as I was working on the book years, a few years ago. I remember I was having dinner with a friend in, um, in Sweden, actually. Uh, no, Copenhagen uh, at the Alzheimer's meetings. And it was that Alzheimer's is a disease of autonomy. Because early and relentlessly, what the disease does is it takes away, chips away, chips away at a person's ability to self-determine her life. We talked earlier about, you know, what am I going to have for dinner and then making that decision and enacting it. Alzheimer's gets in the way of your ability to do these things that are very quotidian across individuals, not terribly interesting, but for a person are really quite interesting because it's my life. I'll choose to live the way I want to live. Well, those kind of sentiments, it's my life, I will choose to live how I want to live, those are extremely actually modern sentiments that come out of liberal democratic traditions. 
And, and even in a liberal democracy such as mine, we're not normative for all until the late 20th century. I mean, in the early creation of my country, you could only vote if you were a male uh, and in many places property holding. If you were a, a person of color, uh, of African ancestry in particular, not only could you not vote, but you could be enslaved. You could be owned like the way I own my copy of my book. Well, you know, in a milieu like that, autonomy is not a widely respected value. And I, one of the points I think that uh, I, I make in the book is it wasn't until autonomy became widely recognized as something we cherish that a disease whose earliest signs and symptoms are chipping away at that wouldn't be really fully felt and seen as a disease, particularly if it's a common problem, say, in older adults. Well, all older adults are a little forgetful and have some trouble, so it's sort of normal. And 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 since it's normal, and you know, we don't really care about autonomy because you know we're still working out as a culture who who gets to self determine his life. It's hard to see it as a disease, and so it's only until literally the late last quarter of the 20th century, which is why Alzheimer's took off after about 1980. Because it's only after about 1980 that, for example, in my country, a woman could go to the military academy. <laughs> um, you know, and, and a lot of this story is told through the story of women. Um, and and I, I spend a lot of time, and in fact, in the book, I have a, whole, a chapter which speaks about uh, the tensions in the women's movement. Uh, because not only is it about autonomy and self-determination and the threats to that, um, making loss of autonomy unwanted, but it's also about gender as it plays out in the caregiving world um, and the recognition of the role of caregiver as a distinct role other than whatever your other family roles are of wife, daughter, daughter-in-law, mother. You just mentioned about you know caregiver and it, we talked earlier about the dyad between the patient uh, yeah. and the caregiver. Um, and when somebody lives with um dementia or um uh, alzheimer's disease or any other cause for for uh, dementia um it's not only the patient who is living with it but also the family uh and you you mentioned um in the book uh, a story f uh, of uh, mrs phillips um who yeah. was when when they got the diagnosis of alzheimer's disease although cognitively she wasn't very impaired at the time um the diagnosis was devastating for her but actually um there are some instances when appropriately given the diagnosis could be of some advantage which may oh, yeah. may not be obvious to to people and what might these these advantages be what might what what might the advantages of having an appropriate diagnosis be um for for the patient and and the caregivers yeah yeah the story of mrs phillips haunts me even to this day she's a woman who had mild cognitive impairment who i used biomarker tests on to determine that her mild cognitive impairment was caused by alzheimer's so she would have the earliest clinical signs and symptoms of alzheimer's and as I recount in the book, she was devastated by that label, as was her daughter. Um, and um, it, uh, certainly her story is not as not common, which is good, uh, <laughs> but uh, in my practice, but it stood out to me, and that's why I recounted in the book. Yeah. Um, and and you know, all it takes is one like that to make you realize how can I do this right? Um, and I think a key point about her story is they came to me seeking help. In other words, they came to the Penn Memory Center. There was no subtlety or nuance about why we're here, and yet they had the reaction they had. Um, and 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 there's matters around stigma, which we'll talk about, that I think that her story brings out. But what is the value of diagnosis? Because so her case was a good case for people to say, why did you do this? You know, mild cognitive impairment. So she's not disabled, and and there's not a treatment you could give her for her Alzheimer's disease. So what on earth did you push it to that level for? And yet, what I'll come back to is, and I'm speaking personally now because my father has Alzheimer's disease. He was diagnosed in the MCI stage by my colleague at the Memory Center. And 
he, I brought this up to him. I'm noticing changes, noticing problems. We should get this checked out. He agreed. And I have to say that done right and delivered right, given him that label of Alzheimer's has been, and I will now generalize in my patient population, is very helpful to explain what you're experiencing, both as an individual with the problems and the person watching that person, and begin to plan for the future. And this is a very important point about planning for the future. It's not about planning for ventilators and feeding tubes and these things down the road and whether you go to a nursing home, because who the hell knows about those things? I mean, it's like, it's like planning for your high school reunion when you haven't gotten out of grade school, for God's sakes, let alone gone to high school. But it is about planning around how are we gonna live a typical day that's safe, social, and engaged? How are we gonna make sure uh, that the checkbook doesn't become a disaster, that you don't get defrauded, that um, uh, 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 the medication box isn't a mess. How can we maintain as much of your independence while also recognizing the need for interdependence? How can we begin to develop a productive relationship to make decisions together rather than just by wait till you can't and I step in and take over? And you know that's the kind of planning that I think needs to go on. And yes, there's also some of those documents like you know powers of attorney and issues around property and whatnot. Um, but but it's about allowing an individual to begin to self-determine in an interdependent way with another person, at least one other person. In the case of my father, it's my father and I. He's 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 long ago separated, et cetera. Um, and 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 for me to begin to take on that caregiving role. Um, at a distance, for example. So I think, you know, I used to be of the view coming out of an internal medicine background that was very skeptical about diagnosis and whatnot. I've actually become very bullish about it where there are problems that they need to be explained and made sense of and plans for the here and now need to be put in to assure that a day is safe, social and engaged and that all functional needs are well met. And that has nothing to do with pills. Um, although certainly if there were medications that were effective, those would be part of the discussion as well. But it, but this should happen regardless of whether they're effective therapeutics. And it's also about future planning as well, isn't it? Um, you mentioned about power of attorney uh, and um, here in the UK, we, we have um, a new uh, way of discussing kind of end of life um, care um, for, for our patients. And we start these conversations typically as early as possible so not not uh, at the end of life but when people are still uh, have capacity to to discuss with us and with their family what their wishes are um, yeah. and, and to get these conversations um started so that um the caregivers uh, and healthcare professionals alike where we all then act in the, the patient's best interest when they no longer have the capacity to do so for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I commend that kind of effort. Um, I, um, and I will say one conversation that I find awkward and because I don't, is this sort of conversation around feeding. You know, so some folks um, say, well, you know, when I can't feed myself, don't feed me, let me die, therefore. And um, I, I push that issue on the table here because I find that I find. So the one thing I find problematic about advanced planning is this idea that the now self the, is planning for a future self mm -hmm. so that in the future, the now self is treated based on what the then self wanted. And I have more and more found that this, this, these, these, this attempt to dichotomize the self into a then self, now self, or now self, future self, is narratively incoherent. It doesn't respect ourselves as ourselves are constructed and lived. That all of ourselves are a bit of the now self and a bit of the then self enacted with other selves. And in the case of, that's even the case of a person with advanced dementia. There's a now self, and there's a then self that are both present and there's an interconnected self with another individual. And therefore, I find these like, let's write it down and plan it 10 years earlier to be a little disingenuous. So you say, well, what should people do? You know, stick their, I don't know if ostriches actually stick their head in the sand, but do whatever ostriches do with their heads. It's 
symbolic of not thinking. Um, but uh, instead, I think there should be efforts to try and better create kind of an interdependent narrative between caregiver and patient and an understanding of the future interdependence that's going to be needed. And, and I think a recognition of the ability to let the caregiver say no to things that don't make sense or say yes to things that make sense and, and to feel that moral power. Because for many caregivers, the threat that they feel is they can't say no to anything uh, and, and the guilt is on them. Yeah. Um, and they, the research we're doing on perception of mind and caregivers is really fascinating. They're caring. I mean, I saw a patient two weeks ago in my practice who, by the standard metrics of severity, was really quite ill. She ha had to wear an undergarment because of incontinence of urine and bowel, starts to need some help feeding, although basically feeds herself, needs someone to bathe and dress her, walks around but is a bit unsteady, and a typical conversational exchange is not terribly understandable. And yet, her daughter thinks her mother is, quote, still in there mm -hmm. and was mourning the fact that her mother had until recently been joking with the with the daughter's boyfriend. And 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 in her view, her mother's ability to joke with her boyfriend and she jokes, and said, you're my boyfriend. And she kind of lift her eyebrow. You're my boyfriend. The fact that her mother would say to this new boyfriend, you're my boyfriend. She read and said, see, she knows he's my boyfriend, even though he's new. She hasn't, he's just been in the house for a year. And this wit that she's committing showed such perception of the here and the now that regardless of the fact that she needed diapers, et cetera, meant that she's still in there. And so for this daughter, it's absolute torture in some sense that my mom's there, but not there. Yeah. And so that's why decisions are for caregivers are so morally charged. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I get what you were saying earlier about the, the guilt of, you know, saying saying no. Um, and I think um, that's why I, I see personally see value in having, you know, opening up these dialogues early um, yeah. so that everyone's kind of on the same page uh, as to the general idea of of um, the the patient's uh, wishes. Um, yeah, I mean, dementia is a cognitively transformative event, and you could argue uh, there's this theory in philosophy that there are these transformative events of self, like pregnancy, childbirth, yeah. um, quadriparesis, that you can think about what and plan for it. But until you experience it, you actually don't know what it's like. Very true. You know, like, yeah. like, could a caterpillar plan for what it will be like to be a butterfly? You know, it's like, I, I will fly to flower. I have no idea what it's like to fly. I'm a worm. <laughs> like, I, you know, uh, so, you know, an advanced directive for life as a butterfly written by a caterpillar would only be just so speculative, you know? Um, and I think dementia is like that. I mean, it, it, there is this cognitive... Yeah formative aspect to it such that you don't know what it's like to you're on the other side and so i think we have to be very careful about thinking that we can tidy this all up with the best laid plans yeah um well what, what i'm talking about is not an advanced directive but mm -hmm. a um kind of a gen general discussion which is to yeah. be reviewed um uh, and um it's not set in stone and can be changed yeah, no, and, 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 I, and, and I hear that, like, for me, I'll tell you one of the things, like, for me is, I think I don't want to ever be dressed in, like, sports gear, like, like you know, wearing the local football jersey and whatnot, you know, and I don't want to be called Dr. J. I just, uh -huh. maybe I will want to be called Dr. J and have a develop a fascination with the Philadelphia Eagles, but I strongly doubt it will happen. So I guess it gets at aspects of dignity, you know. Um, unless proven otherwise, I'm Jason or Dr. Carla Wish, you know, and do not dress me in a Philadelphia Eagles t-shirt. <laughs> I don't have an objection to the Eagles. I just don't like to wear sportswear. I find it kind of silly. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> uh, and just now you were talking about um, the mother having that kind of, uh, you know, that witty jokiness. 
um, yeah. that, that the daughter then found difficult to, you know, to that, it, that she wasn't doing it anymore. Yeah, it stopped if she hadn't been joking. Right, um, and y you mention actually in the book um, a a couple who really reminded me of of one one of the couples um, that I, I've uh, seen um, a couple of years ago. So it's the story of Darren and Beverly Johnson. Um, that was particularly familiar to me. Actually, all aspects. Um, just kind of rang true of a lot of the patients that I have seen with dementia. Um, and it reminded me of uh, a home visit that I was called out to. Um, so I went to see them at home and it was the wife basically getting very, very frustrated with her husband for not listening to her. Uh, and the home visit was really, doctor, can you just tell him to listen to me and do what I say? <laughs> Um, so um, when when you wrote about Darren and Beverly and his kind of repetitive questioning uh, and how right. maddening it was for Beverly, uh, that just really you know reminded me of, of this couple. Um, and and later on in the book, you mentioned that that although he had problems with memory, attention, and concentration, his ability to feel emotions of fear and joy was still intact. And so was his ability to imagine. Is, is that true for all people with or, or most cases of dementia? Or, or is that really kind of on an individual basis? Um, the ability It's, it's of, true enough that it should be thought about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So despite profound, you know, I mean, the brain is a as a many and multifaceted organ. It's 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 uh, not a lens, but a prism that reflects light in all different directions, so to speak. And yes, I mean, patients despite the fact they may not remember who you are, will certainly pick up the emotion of who you are when you present yourself to them and even retain a memory of that emotion despite not remembering, I don't remember your name, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and, and, be, and yes, you know, uh, despite the fact they may have impairments in language, still can engage in creative acts, you know. Um, uh, they just need someone to help them do those acts, you know, and, uh, uh, so one of the chapters in the book, actually, I interview Ann Basting, Ann Basting, who wrote a book called Creative Care, which I highly recommend, Creative Care by Ann Basting, B-A-S-T-I-N-G. And she talks about very organized, not just, oh, yeah, wouldn't it be fun, but concrete ways to use creativity to live with and care for and be part of the life of someone with dementia. So back to the repetitious questions, which drove Beverly Johnson so mad, and that was the word I used, maddening, actually. It's funny. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one, what, what, there are several ways to respond to repetitious questions. One is to just um, keep on answering it until mm -hmm. you go mad. Another is to blow up and say, I already answered that. Another is, to answer it with a question. So, you know, classic repetitious question, you know, when are the grandkids coming over? You know, they say, well, when they're here, what do you want to do with them? So I didn't answer the question. I told you, three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> um, or stop asking me that, but rather, well, what, when they're here, what do you want to do with them? And take it from there. Um, and, you know, that, that use of questions back, it's not to turn it into an analysis session, but it's to say, let's try to create something. So another example that Anne create, shows is um, that dreadful question of, you know, when are we going home? Well, we are home. Hmm. Um, instead, well, what would we do when we get home? Or what would you like to do at home? Or, you know, we spent a lot of time together. We ought to get married, says the wife to the husband of 56 years. Who would we invite to the wedding? What would we do? So, you know, it, I'm not trying to make it like, oh, and that's so nice, but it's a way to say, let's work from the idea of what would a wedding be like and create that wedding. It's not to lie, but it's not to say we must immerse ourselves into this brutal truth of we are married. You keep on forgetting that we're married. <laughs> you know? um, and, and so it's another approach, a third way in some sense, to deal with some of the more devastating, and they are devastating, uh, problems that persons with, living with dementia have with, with their caregivers. 
And and you talked about actually between um, the the patient uh, and the caregiver, um, your your role uh, as a clinician, part of it is to help them arrive at a common understanding of facts yeah. uh, in, in clinic. Can you kind of explain what, what you mean by that? Yeah, this is a really, I, I'm very, this is a, this is a, I mean, it's art because it varies from person to person, but it's, I, I ground this in the psychology of mind, um, that we have to create some common extended mind here between the two of you, um, recognizing there may be differences of perception. So, you know, um, I mean, a common, very common phenomenon. I saw a patient last week, very mild presentation, MCI, inefficiencies, not disabled, but clearly has cognitive impairments, um, mild though they are. And I think based on all the data, I think she's got early, all, or early symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Her brain has a neurodegenerative disease. Okay. And she was aware of it. She knew she's having trouble driving. Like, I'm not as good with the route. She knew she wasn't as sharp as she used to be. And she also felt she was getting on in life pretty much okay, all of which is true. But her conclusion was, I wasn't gonna come and see you, but my brother really pushed this over months and finally she gave in. So what's my point? Between the person with the disease in her brain and the person observing the disease in that person, there's this interesting difference in perception of what's wrong and a drive to wanna do something about it. It's this interesting sort of accommodation to disability in the person. And on the other side, though, a recognition by the other person that there's something wrong there. And so what my goal is, is to bring out in the end of a clinic visit, each person's perception. So I know you have noticed you're having some memory trouble. And in fact, you told me, you know, that you have a bit of trouble sometimes with driving, but otherwise you're doing fine. Um, but your brother's noticed it as well. Um, and he's also concerned as well about it. So I'll say what each person's perception is to the two of them. And I'll even do it when it's really different. When the family member is reporting a history that's vivid and the person's like, I'm fine, I don't know why I'm here. I'll say, well, I know you think you're fine and you know, you said you're fine, there's nothing. I'll quote them even, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll take out my notes. I use a, I, I handwrite notes, I don't, and then I put it in the computer later, which takes hours and hours, but anyway. And I'll quote them, I'll say, I know you think everything's fine and you're, you maybe have a little bit of a memory problem, but your son sees it a little differently. He's noticed some other, you know, and they'll like look at each other like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to create a consensus that there's something that we need to attend to. Um, and I think that's so important for them to communicate about it or know what not to communicate about for a common way forward and to try and interconnect them rather than having them at this distance of, you know, we can't talk about it and you're different than I am and whatnot. So that, that's, that's my agenda in that. And I'm very, I think it's an extremely important part of delivering um, uh, ethically, and clinically uh, appropriate care. Yeah, we'll talk about um, the art of medicine in a bit, but um, I just want to give uh, our audience some more um, sort of uh, maybe tips on how to, um, for, for the caregivers particularly, um, we kind of talked about communication uh, and, and managing repetitive questions. What about um, asking for help uh, and, and um, those sort of things, how, what for kind of advice or yeah, for, for the caregiver, yeah. how do yeah, no, they kind of approach that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the cottage industry of studying <laughs> caregiving has been around since the 80s and, you know, very well described the impact of caregiving on caregivers, physical and mental health. They have higher uh, uh, comparative rates of depressive and anxiety symptoms, greater um, financial strain uh, than persons who are not in the caregiving role. <laughs> Um, not all have it, but many do enough that we should care about it. Um, so care about their mental health um, and care about their financial health. And in the States, their financial health can be viciously threatened because in, in my country, we don't support uh, access to and um, availability of long term care services and supports unless you qualify for poverty level needs. Um, so you're left to, to figure it out on your own. Um, but uh, 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 so I, uh, in my practice, I have actually I have this templated note with just headers of things to ask about just to remind me, you know, cognition, sleep, and, and then I fill in. And one of the lines in my templated note is caregiver. 
And when I hit that point in my clinical visit, I'll say, and what about you? How are you doing? And I always give that a three count because then they'll pop someone out typically. Um, and then the second question I ask is, is there anything you need? Mm -hmm. And I give that a three count. <laughs> and you know, um, some are like, I'm doing okay. Nope, we're good for now. And others are, they burst into tears and they say, you know, I need a friend. I'm so lonely and, and everything else. But until you ask, you won't get it. And, you know, yes, I'm here billing for your <laughs> diagnosis and billing for your relative. But if I don't tend to you, you know, um, I know I'm not going to take care of him or her. You know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, and I do the same as well. When, when people call about their relatives, I often do ask, you know, what about you? How are you doing? And, you know, are yeah. you, the are other you thing I do, by the way, in my practice, when I talk to the caregiver, it, as impaired as the patient is, and some of them are really impaired. I mean, they're, you know, I always say, say hi to Mr. Carlowish for me. Say hi to Mr. Jones for me. Say hi to your mom for me. Mm -hmm. And many of them say thank you. And, you know, I, you know, I don't know if Mr. Jones knows who I am or remembers who I am. Um, but it's sort of just acknowledging, like, you know, we've been talking about this other person. Yeah. I just want to do the ultimate way to sort of acknowledge that the other person's a person, which is make sure you say hi to them for me. Absolutely. So, and I think the caregivers, I think I do that as much, I think, for the caregiver to, just to let them know, you know, I'm thinking of your relative as a person and I know you're caring for a person. This isn't custodial care. You know, they're not a building <laughs> needs to be swept out and mopped. And <laughs> scrubbed. You know, that used to be the phrase, you know, at least in the States, we would call it custodial care. The person needs mm -hmm. custodial care um, like they were a, a building all of a sudden. Look, one of the points I make in the book, and this is an extremely important point. Humans have been caring for other humans since humans have been humans yeah. and need care. Um, in the Bible, the book of Ruth is the story of Ruth, who is the daughter-in-law of Naomi and gives care to her mother-in-law. Both Ruth and Naomi are widowed and like good uh, 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 Hebrew women of, the, of that time, absent a husband, of course, the answer is you gotta go find a new man. Naomi is old, so she's not gonna find a husband anymore. Ruth's still young and Naomi says to Ruth, well, you're gonna probably go back to your village to get a husband, right? So just leave me here to die. Or, you know, she didn't say it that way, but you know, I'll be fine, says the old woman. She says, no, I'll stay here and I'll take care of you, mother-in-law Naomi. And Ruth does that. And that's what the book of Ruth is about in the Bible. It's the story of a caregiver, Ruth caring for her mother-in-law. And they're impoverished. She has to gather sheaves of wheat that are dropped by farmers because that she doesn't have any income because she doesn't have a man. Anyway, what's my point? Nowhere in the book of Ruth, and this is not an issue of translation, is she described as uh, there's a jet flying over, which is rather threatening, like a, like a serious jet, not a not just a plane jet. But yeah, I can hear it from here. <laughs> like a jet jet. Like a, oh, well, if the bombs start, you'll know why. <laughs> anyway, uh, nowhere in the book of Ruth is Naomi described um, as, as, as Ruth described as Naomi's caregiver. She's just a good daughter-in-law doing what a good daughter-in-law does. The word caregiver actually was rarely, if ever, used until about 1980. Um, prior to that, it was just good spouses doing what spouses do, good daughters doing what daughters do, good whatever. It was baked into those familial roles. Um, and it was only by basically economics, social science, and other disciplines, advocates, that that role got its own name, the caregiver. <laughs> And it's a distinct role, it has work, it takes time, it costs money, and if you can't do it, you have to pay someone else to do it. And that is why Alzheimer's um, is recognized as such a big problem, because it's such a costly disease to the caregiver, to the family. Yeah. Um, and and um, I wondered if um, in the book as well, you talked about how to um find ways of doing activities or things together that perhaps one one person um the the patient used to take care of but now no longer have the ability to to fully kind of do it themselves independently um what advice do you have for for people with with that problem the problem of we don't have anything to do together 
uh yeah or, or how 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 can people kind of uh create or uh, activities together or even simple yeah. things yeah you know so it's interesting um the quotidian aspects of life are just that and yet um you know one of the things caregivers often struggle with is well the routines we used to have as a couple we don't really have so what do we do and it really is about you know make a list of some things you could do pick one even if it's the one that's the least interesting but it's the one you most can do and just do it like we're going to go for a walk we never went on walks together but we're going to start going for walks um whatever it may be but just pick one thing and do it together because of what a lot of couples struggle with is we don't really do anything together you know um he doesn't really converse much with me well, you know, it's understandable. He, you know, language drive and apathy are dominant here, but there's other things and conversations that you can do together. Um, let's make a list. Start with things even that are so simple that they don't seem to even be interesting, but just make that list, pick it, and then do it. You know, if you think about it, for many couples up until disease arrives, they're busy with their lives, both as a couple, but also their, you know, work life. I mean, I spend more time away from my husband than with him because I'm doing interviews on Zoom calls. <laughs> You know, um, but if uh, he got disabling impairments, I'd spend more time with him and I would have to think about, well, now what are we going to do together? Because we're around each other more. And it would have to be very intentional, make the list and let's pick something. And I think that's back to what a caregiver's need. People with diabetes need to be trained about how to create a diabetic diet that works for them, right? How to engage in activity that helps them burn some more calories. And they go to a dietitian to get that training, right? So too with people with heart disease. What kind of activity should I do to try to restore my, well, people with Alzheimer's have these caregivers and they need training for how to do that, you know, and we should provide that training. And, and the story of Dick Darren and Beverly Johnson is a good example of, I try to lay out the kind of training we give. Yeah. And it's as important as, as I, I talked about diabetes and heart disease because no one disputes if you've got diabetes, you know, I should probably meet a nutritionist. Absolutely, you should meet a nutritionist. We should figure out how to put together a meal. It's gonna be, work for you and your diabetes. Um, and no one disputes that. In fact, my healthcare system will pay for it. Well, it's not mine, but you know, my country's healthcare system will pay for that. But we don't pay for the ability to tell a caregiver, to train a caregiver how to be a caregiver. We just sort of, you know, there's some books, you can go read them and they're very good books, but we don't provide those services. We don't help them. We let them just figure it out on our own. We don't even guide them to those services yeah. either. It's even more shocking. You know, we just let, like, go figure it out. That's yeah. it joke around diagnosis and adiosis <laughs> and and a common thing that people do friends and relatives when they come to visit is ask you know do you know who i am yeah lord knows i always do that when i visit my friends yeah. <laughs> well that's my point which is you know we don't routinely when we pop over to someone's house say yeah. hi do you know who i am <laughs> mm -hmm. We assume you know who I am, um, and and I think you know. Um, I mean, I think you have to read social cues. If the person's struggling, you can say they're feeling awkward because they don't remember your name. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, these kind of the sort of othering that occurs from the get go, you know, um, it, it, you know, it, the per people with Alzheimer's disease or other causes of dementia, oftentimes they're very aware of their deficits. They minimize their functional impact. It's fascinating, the disability aspects, but they're very aware of their cognitive problems. They'll say, oh, I'm, a, I'm an idiot, you know, I, I'm stupid, et cetera. So when someone says, do you know who I am? They're like, you know what you're doing? You're once again reminding me that I don't have a bad memory and thanks a lot for insulting me yet again. <laughs> yeah. So is it is it helpful for, for people just to kind of maybe introduce themselves when when they when they see people um with dementia or or is that not not helpful to do either well i think we should always just work from the social cues that we generally work from i mean if you haven't seen someone in a while it's like you know i mean how do you sort of reconnect with them and what do you say to just a family member who you haven't seen yeah. in a while um you know uh uh etc et um you know the um but I do talk about in the book I have, uh, uh, about communication um, and it back to actually Darren and Beverly Johnson. There's this one chapter called Not Legally Dead Yet. It's about capacity assessment, but it begins with not so much issues of capacity, but just plain communication. And I recount how 
um, that particularly the healthcare team, we're the worst for this, uh, healthcare providers, how we baby talk people with yeah. dementia. Hi, Erica, how you doing? Are you okay today? It's good to see you, you know, and I just, I do not understand why we baby talk. Now, I got into a bit of a exchange years ago with some residents, uh, one of whom like, well, they're so scared and we have to make them feel comfortable. I'm like, well, well, first find out if they're scared, maybe ask why they're scared, and based on why they say they're scared, help to reassure them. But don't assume the moment you walk into the room, and this was inpatient medicine, that everyone who looks old and rather miserable when you, by the time we get through with them in the hospital, in terms of their appearance, that you should walk into the room and talk to them like they're six years old going on four. Now, you know, I mean, um, and and they know it. I mean, they, they hear you walk in and talk like that. They're like, they're talking to me like a baby, you know, and it's very demeaning to the, to the individual. So my default when I talk to my patients is I just talk to them like I'm talking to you. If yeah. they're very distressed and whatnot, I ad adopt my emotional tone to, you know, but if they're sitting there looking at me and go, I, I just say, well, you know, you know, you know, uh, hi, Ms. Lynn, it's a pleasure to see you today. I'm Dr. Carlowish. How, how are you feeling today? And just start from a normal adult tone. Of yeah. I mean, I witnessed a nurse practitioner once, a geriatric nurse practitioner, sit in front of a patient's bed and like, how are you doing today? What kind of things do you like to do when you're at home? I'm like, what, what is going on here? What is she, an idiot? What are you, an idiot? I, I, I'll never forget that. Like, you know, and the patient's answering her, but I, I just find that bizarre. It so others you. I mean, no one talks to another adult that way. Yeah. Here. I mean, you know, like, and actually talking about healthcare providers, I just want to, it, it seems like over the centuries and the decades, uh, we, the role of a doctor seems to have changed over time. Um, and in, in our, one of the modern um, variation of the Hippocratic Oath, I think there are a couple of things in there that really resonate so much with what we're talking about today. So I'm just gonna read them out, just bear with me. So sure. I will remember that there is art to medicine as well as science and that warmth sympathy and understanding may outweigh the surgeon's knife or the chemist's drug. I will remember that I do not treat a fever chart, a cancerous growth, but a sick human being whose illness may affect the person's family and economic stability. My responsibility includes these related problems if I am to care adequately for the sick. But it seems like in our modern definition of, of what a doctor is, they don't extend or encompass, extend to or encompass these uh, other responsibilities. So for example, in, in the Cambridge Dictionary, the definition of a doctor is, is a person with a medical degree whose job is to treat people who are ill or hurt. And in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a person who is trained and licensed to treat sick and injured people but as you as you very you know nicely said uh, and laid out in the book that actually treatment for uh dementia they are often social environmental and psychological interventions uh, and many of which are not conventionally considered as treatment by other healthcare providers uh, yeah. patients themselves, families, uh, and society in general. So where do we fit into the equation with regards to um, the management in dementia and, and what can caregivers and patients expect from their doctors? Well, what they should expect is a doctor whose goal is to finish up a visit where the visit is focused on, on, the, on dementia. And the doctor should be saying, what's the stage in her head? What's the stage of the disease? Are all functional needs well met? And is the day, is the person's day generally safe, social, and engaged? And so if the answer, so the stage, are all functional needs well met? And is the day social engaged? For most of the, when you do say, you know, not all functional needs are well met. There's a couple of IADLs that I identified that seem to be a little uh, disorganized. Or the day is safe, 
but it's not very social. Or the day is safe and social, but there's not a lot of engagement doing things. Most of the solutions for those have nothing to do with my skill set, meaning things that I would prescribe because I can't prescribe social care. But what I need to do is get them to the people who deliver social care. Um, so in my memory center, because a very wealthy philanthropist gave us money, we have a social work team. And I have I, I routinely actually am having, I would say, 50% of my visits uh, in a typical day at the memory center uh, result in an uh, on-the-spot meeting with a social work team. And I'll walk in, I'll say, sir, okay, uh, the other one I just met with, yeah, things are basically fine except for one issue. Uh, the, the husband insists still on managing the checkbook. And I was wondering if you could sit, I've explained that, that you know, could you sit down with them now and help them work out a plan for that? Okay. Or I just met with, you know, and, you know, they need access to an adult day activity program. Could you meet with them and find out, given where they live, what are some of the options for adult day activity? You know, so, I mean, it's no different than a, you know, any, most, a lot of medicine, you have a host of paraprofessionals around you that work together with, I mean, you know, surgeons don't do the anesthesia scrubbing and everything else on their own. They've got this little team there, right? You know, cardiologists have the cath lab and the, you know, the, 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 the therapist, the physical therapist and the cardiovascular rehab who they prescribe. It, it's the same way with our field. It's just less recognized and certainly not as well supported as cath labs and cardiac rehabs and operative suites. But that, those, those are policy issues. Those are not, those are, those are not our fault as, because they're just, the system won't provide it. And, and so um, I just noticing the time, I think I could talk to you for days, Jason, <laughs> um, but I, I want to cover two, two more things. Uh, the first one sure. is, um, is deterioration in brain function inevitable with age or is dementia um, preventable? or at least to an extent? Um, I'll start with your last bit there. Dementia is preventable. We know it's preventable because the last 40 years, uh, we've seen a consistent finding across multiple well-designed large uh, longitudinal studies that have followed hundreds of thousands of adults that the risk of developing dementia has been declining. There's still plenty of people with dementia because there are a lot of people getting older, but they're not as many as we thought there should be. And it's because the risk of developing dementia has been declining. And the answer behind that it begins in early life with access to quality education uh, and all the things that follow from that in terms of access to social and economic well-being, access to quality health care from early life, midlife onward, particularly cardiovascular health care, um, and then heart healthy habits, particularly uh, a, a, a stable cardiovascular health uh, exercise um, uh, and um, a diet that uh, reduces the risk of high blood pressure and so salt uh, reduction in typical. So the data are all there actually about a variety of things you can do to lead a brain healthy life and reduce the risk of dementia. Um, having said that, some degree of cognitive change with aging is fairly universal across a variety of human and non-human mammalian species. Namely, uh, changes in executive function are fairly common with aging. Uh, independent of the presence of the classic pathologies that cause dementing disorders. The phenomena is called cognitive aging, and it's a very real phenomenon, namely people experience um, the need for more time to work out a problem um, and uh, uh, more trouble with what we call fluid intelligence. Um, and it can cause problems with day-to-day -day function. Um, it's very variable. You can find 80-year-olds who are pretty sharp, and you can find 80 year olds who have a lot of cognitive aging and are making bad decisions because under pressure and new information, they don't quite get it. And yet they're not, they do not meet criteria for dementia and there's no evidence of disease in their brain. So um, in summary, there's lots we can do to maintain our brain health. Uh, I recommend a website, the Global Council on Brain Health, Truly Global by AARP, has a great summary of what you can do to maintain your brain health. And number two, Cognitive aging is real. We do experience changes in our cognition as we age. Uh, we Not uniformly, not consistently, but we certainly do uh, experience it. Okay, and, and that lastly, um, uh, 
in the book you quoted uh, David uh, McCullough. Um, I'm just going to read that bit out. Um, there is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. Never was, never will be. We are all, as were those in the footsteps we follow, shaped by the influence and examples of countless others, parents, grandparents, friends and rivals. But somehow we've been conditioned to think that independence is strength. Yeah. Uh, and modern society uh, and modern advances in our you know, fast paced society where families and communities have really become quite fragmented it can make life quite difficult for those living with dementia. And when I say people living with dementia, I mean both the patient and, and the caregiver. Um, and so looking into the future, how, in, in your opinion, how can we as a society better improve the care for people living with dementia? Yeah, um, it's funny you picked up that McCullough quote because it's always stuck with me. Um, and I don't think he thought at all that he was talking about aging and living with disabling cognitive impairments but that quote so resonates look i love my independence and my freedom i will choose who i want to be interdependent with but to think that independence means you are embarrassed by otherwise don't see yourself as interdependent is just it's, it's actually just epistemical epistemologically wrong we are interdependent our minds are interconnected with our environments the objects around us and they're interconnected with the individuals we're around and there's no better way to prove that than to look at the lives of persons with dementia who are living good lives and living well and their caregivers to see that kind of that, that played out the way the environment is shaped and the relationships are shaped they're a very interesting case study in how we ought to live as normal cognitively healthy individuals and you bring up some interesting points i think that um uh 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 uh, th this idea of being, you know, independent is 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 is, is, is should be flaunted by our society is, is is just an exaggeration. So what should we think? What should we think about? Let me leave you with a couple points. I think that um, uh, uh, we should we should kind of recognize that um, uh, 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 science and culture made this disease common, but politics made it a crisis. There are things that we did that made this disease a crisis. The failure to take care of caregivers is one of them. These are correctable things. We're making great progress with biomarkers and drugs to develop ways to diagnose the disease early and treat the disease even before you have dementia. But the studies we're doing show us that we're not, this is not like COVID, this is not polio. We don't need to just, we're not gonna find the one vaccine that wipes out the many different pathologies that cause dementia. So we should expect this to be a treatable disease, but we're going to have to learn how to live with dementia. And then, you know, the point I made earlier, we know how to do that. We talked earlier about coordinated care and other can do now things to improve the delivery of care to persons with dementia, caregiver training and education and supports, coordinated care, and all the things we can do to preserve our brain health that have been working over the last 40 years to reduce the risk of dementia. So I guess my message is, not that, oh, we should cure this. Of course, we should aspire to better treatments and might one be a cure? Well, yes, and we also might all achieve salvation. But I think until, I think living for only salvation is probably not very rational living. You know, we're going to have to learn how to live with dementia. The question is how we're gonna to learn to live well. So back to your original point, it's about recognizing the interdependence of our minds as patient and as caregiver and as families, yes. And actually, as you as you mentioned just now as well, um, dementia is is preventable, uh, and you know good cardiovascular health uh, is good brain health as well. So let's yep. not forget that. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And, and so um, thank you so much for for today's discussion. And before we move on to to the uh, latter part of our event uh, with the um, with the off recording uh, group discussion. Um, could you leave our listeners with three practical um, takeaways uh, that they could implement straight away uh, with regards to good uh, brain health? Yeah. Um, eat a heart healthy diet, 
walk 30 minutes a day at least three to four days a week or swim it or run it or bike it and uh, enjoy a glass of red wine while you read my book. <laughs> that will give you both a good diet, good activity, and exercise your brain by reading a fascinating book. <laughs> the book is, is great and I'll, I'll leave uh, a yeah. link in the Here chat. It is. There it is. Mine is uh, very much highlighted everywhere. That's why oh. I said I could be here days if I wanted to talk to you about all those points. Um, yeah, you can go to my website, jasoncarlers.com, and I've got a lot of my essays there that I've written for uh, uh, a variety of publications on, on a host of topics around aging, ethics, etc. But it's, yeah, it's hardback as well as ebook. And if you're in the States, at least, you can get a nice audiobook version of it. And I would ask folks, if you read it and you like it, put a little few stars up on one of those review boards because people like those and whatnot. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Great. Uh, and so if you, if you want to continue this conversation, do become a, um, an Afternoon Tea with Docs member uh, on uh, our website, um, which again, I'll leave the link in, in the chat for you. Um, and um, to join really our supportive community to help you implement uh, healthful lifestyle changes that you want to live a long and fulfilling life um, and uh, do let us know how we're doing uh, in the chat uh, and also uh, on uh, the YouTube comments um, yeah so thank you very much and I'll just Welcome. thank you Jason and I'll stop the recording now